Now uh, we are going to start with the uh, second le lecture of today uh, with Dr. Rona again. Uh, the title of the lecture is uh, Monitoring the Implementation of the Istanbul Convention. Uh, we have 45 minutes for presentation. Uh, so uh, after that, again, uh, there, there will be an, an question and answer part. Uh, again, you can write your answers, uh, you can write your questions to the box. So uh, thank you. And the floor is yours again, Dr. Rana. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. So um, the reporting procedure then, which constitutes the primary monitoring mechanism for the Istanbul Convention commenced in March of 2016. And currently 17 states um, have undergone the first round of reporting. And so the time is ripe for an initial assessment of monitoring under the Istanbul Convention. So this presentation then will begin with a brief overview of the Convention's monitoring mechanism. And it is notable that the Istanbul Convention's reporting procedure is similar to such procedures under UN human rights treaties, such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Violence Against Women, or CEDAW. Such procedures have encountered substantial difficulties, as will be discussed. And so the question therefore arises of whether it will be possible for such problems to be avoided or at least lessened as regards the Istanbul Convention. Uh, the presentation will then proceed to consider the reporting procedure under the Istanbul Convention as applied to the states which have undergone the initial round of reporting and comparisons will be drawn with the reporting procedure under the UN Human Rights Treaties. So the monitoring mechanisms of the Istanbul Convention are found in Articles 66 to 70 of this instrument. These provisions set up two bodies. Uh, there is firstly a group of experts on action against violence against women and domestic violence. Um, that's shortened usually to Grevio. And secondly, a committee of the parties. Uh, the latter is comprised of representatives of the states which are party to the convention. And the members of Grevio, that's the group of experts in violence against women, are elected by the committee of the parties from among the candidates nominated by the state's parties. And they serve for a term of four years, which is renewable once. Grevio is tasked with the responsibility of monitoring the implementation of the provisions of the convention by states. And Article 68 sets out the monitoring procedures to be carried out by the group of experts. Uh, the primary monitoring mechanism is a reporting procedure. And under Article 68.1, parties shall submit to the Secretary General of the Council of Europe based on a questionnaire prepared by Grevio a report on legislative and other measures giving effect to the provisions of this convention. This report is then considered by Grevio in conjunction with representatives of the state party concerned. So uh, Grevio adopted its baseline questionnaire in March 2016 and completion of this questionnaire requires states to provide detailed information on their compliance with all aspects of the convention. Non-governmental organizations and civil society groups working in the area of combating violence against women are also invited to submit information on the implementation of this convention. 
and under Article 68.3, subsequent evaluation procedures will then be div divided into rounds, the length of which is to be determined by Grevio. And at the beginning of each monitoring round, Grevio will choose the specific provisions of the convention on which the evaluation procedure will focus and will send out a questionnaire accordingly. Article 68.9 provides for the organisation by Grevio of country visits if the information obtained is insufficient. And under Article 68.11, on the basis of all the information received, Grevio adopts a report on the measures taken by the state in question to implement the provisions of the convention, which is sent to the state party and also to the committee of the parties. Grevio's report is made public as are eventual comments from the state party concerned. And under Article 6812, the Committee of the Parties may adopt recommendations addressed to the state in question regarding the measures to be taken to implement the conclusions of Grevio. And in addition, Article 6813 of the Convention provides that if Grevio receives reliable information indicating a situation where problems require immediate attention to prevent or limit the scale or number of serious violations of the Convention, it may request the urgent submission of a special report concerning measures taken to prevent a serious, massive or persistent pattern of violence against women. And under Article 68.14, taking into consideration the information submitted by the state in question, as well as any other reliable information available to it, Grevio may designate one or more of its members to conduct an inquiry and to report back urgently. And finally, under Article 69, Grevio may adopt, where appropriate, general recommendations to states on the implementation of the Convention. Um, the focus of this discussion will be on the activity which has taken place thus far as re regards the reporting mechanism. However, Prior to discussing the steps which have been taken to date as regards monitoring under the Istanbul Convention, it is necessary to provide some context in terms of the difficulties which have emerged as regards monitoring compliance with other human rights treaties, in particular those of the United Nations. And that is given that the monitoring mechanism of the Istanbul Convention bears a strong resemblance to those of the main UN human rights treaties. And it is undeniable that extensive problems with implementation and enforcement affect all of these instruments. Uh, for example, Rhonda Copeland remarks that the international human rights system still operates more in rhetoric rather than in reality. Essentially, it is immensely difficult to compel states to comply with their obligations under human rights treaties if they are reluctant to do so. Um, indeed, Ambieski asserts that the large numbers of ratifications of the UN human rights treaties reflect the widely held view by states parties that there are not serious consequences associated with ratification. And it seems that this failure may be due at least partly to uh, what Jennifer Ulrich refers to as the lack of an international policing force that demands compliance with international edicts. 
So the effectiveness of human rights treaties depends to a large extent on the level of commitment held by states to give effect to their obligations. As James Crawford comments, there are no doubt inherent problems with a system for human rights protection based essentially on self-criticism and good faith. Indeed, Suzanne Egan remarks that the UN human rights treaty bodies, along with national human rights um, institutions and non-governmental organisations, face the task of Sisyphean proportions in coaxing states to implement the treaty body recommendations. And the implementation difficulties which are suffered by the UN human rights treaties have been exacerbated by problems relating to the reporting procedures, which as with the Istanbul Convention are the main monitoring mechanisms of these instruments. Um, to quote uh, Suzanne Egan again, she asserts that many states appear to ignore totally the guidelines which the treaty bodies have produced to assist them in preparing the reports. The quality of the reports can range from being inadequate to blatantly derisory. Formal presentation of the report in the public sessions can often serve to reinforce the impression that the process is not taken seriously by many governments or is at best regarded as an obligatory but essentially shallow diplomatic exercise. And Jane Fortin comments that the reporting mechanism relies on governments to subject their implementation programme to an objective and critical analysis before compiling their reports. The absence of any supervision or coercion over this can lead to reports painting an over-optimistic and complacent picture of government achievements. Prior to the ratification of the Istanbul Convention, the primary human rights treaty body, which monitored the responses of the states in question to the issue of violence against women, was the CEDAW Committee. And as Javed Raymond remarks, the present reporting procedure as provided in the CEDAW Convention, in common with other reporting procedures, has proved less than satisfactory. Reports are often delayed, outdated and inadequate, with most state parties placing emphasis upon the legislative mechanisms relating to gender equality. And as Nicola Lacey comments, the critical dialogue potentially set up by CEDAW is inevitably distorted at every turn by the realities of political, cultural and economic power. <coughs> Excuse me. So when assessing the activity which has taken place to date as regards monitoring under the Istanbul Convention, it is important to bear in mind the difficulties which similar procedures have encountered within the context of the UN. So, as I've already mentioned, 17 states parties have to date undergone the initial round of reporting um, under the Istanbul Convention. And so the reporting procedure as applied to these states uh, will now be examined in this presentation. It is notable that the timetable which has been adopted by Grevio as regards the monitoring of states parties aims at diversity in terms of geographical location and of legal systems. Therefore, although the timetable takes into account the order in which states ratified the convention, it is not the case that states automatically receive the baseline questionnaire in the order of their dates of ratification. Uh, Grevio has, however, now confirmed that in relation um, to 
all states which have ratified or will ratify the convention after the 1st of January 2017, the order of reporting will be determined by the date of ratification and with respect for other international reporting obligations in related fields. So the first observation then which can be made regarding the reporting procedure to date under the Istanbul Convention relates to the level of detail contained within the report submitted by the state's parties. Although this is of course required by the baseline questionnaire, the relatively comprehensive nature of the state reports is nevertheless noteworthy. The subsequent evaluation reports by Grevio are also extremely detailed and assess the level of compliance by each state with its obligations under the Convention as a whole. And in preparing each report, Grevio took into account an evaluation visit to the state party in question. Each report takes the form of highlighting a number of positive aspects, but also drawing attention to a substantial number of areas in which improvement is warranted. And it is of particular note that each of the proposals and suggestions which Grevio makes uses one of four verbs. Uh, the verbs being urge, strongly encourage, encourage or invite. And it is explained in Grevio's reports that the use of these verbs corresponds to different levels of urgency. So urge is used where immediate action is required. So Grevio urges the state to do something and that's where uh, Grevio is of the view that immediate action is necessary. Strongly encouraged, so Grevio strongly encourages the state to do something. That's used when shortcomings need to be remedied in the near future. So that's strongly encouraged. Encourage, so Grevio encourages the state to do something that indicates uh, shortcomings of a lower priority. And invite, so Grevio invites the state in question to do something that indicates small gaps in implementation where the state is requested to consider closing should the opportunity arise. So the adoption of those four levels of priority and the clear explanation of this by Grevio is certainly to be welcomed. And given the substantial number of proposals which are made by Grevio, it is useful for the state concerned to be given an indication of which measures should be prioritised. An interesting and informative aspect um, of the reporting procedure under the Istanbul Convention is that um, comments submitted by the state in question on Grevy's report are also published. And the approaches uh, which the state's parties in question have adopted in formulating um, their comments uh, do vary substantially both in format and also in tone. Um, so the comments that are submitted by the state's parties <coughs> excuse me, um, are all freely available online. So um, if, if you're interested in having a look at those, uh, if you go to Grevio's website, uh, you can look at the comments which the states have all made, um, the states which have to date uh, undergone the first round of reporting, and you will see that they do differ greatly in terms of uh, the format and tone involved. So in terms of whether um, the states are largely accepting of um, the, the comments and recommendations by Grevio, 
uh, whether they are not as accepting um, of all the recommendations which are made to them and also the length of the comments, the level of detail of the comments uh, submitted by the states uh, vary uh, quite substantially as well. Nevertheless, um, the uh, publication of such comments is um, a certainly a very useful and informative exercise. <coughs> Excuse me. An additional stage involved in the reporting mechanism under the Istanbul Convention is the adoption of recommendations by the Committee of the Parties. And in these documents, the state in question is recommended to take immediate action on a number of matters which are identified in the respective report by Grevio. And the matters on which states are recommended by the committee of the parties to take immediate action are generally all of the proposals and suggestions which Grevio had urged the state in question to implement. And also proposals and suggestions of Grevio that are related to chapters one and two of the convention, which require taking of remedial action in the near future, and which are qualified by the use of the expression strongly encourage. And just to say, chapter one of the convention encompasses equality and non-discrimination and general obligations, and chapter two covers integrated policies and data collection. So essentially, the approach of the Committee of the Parties is to um, urge the state to take immediate action on all of the matters which Grevio has urged the state to implement and also the proposals and suggestions which are prefaced by Grevio by strongly encourage and which relate to chapters one and two of the convention. Uh, the recommendations of the Committee of the Parties also all conclude with a general statement that it is recommended that the state in question take measures to implement the further conclusions of Grevio's report as well. States parties are given a period of three years to implement the recommendations of the Committee of the Parties and to report back to the Committee. And states are required to complete a specific questionnaire to report on the implementation of recommendations issued by the Committee of the Parties. So to date, there are four states parties, those being Albania, Austria, Denmark and Monaco, that have reported back to the Committee of Parties. And the reports submitted are detailed documents and it seems that substantial steps are being taken to respond to the recommendations in question. So... To what extent then does the reporting procedure under the Istanbul Convention hold the potential to be more effective than those found in the UN Human Rights Treaties? Well, as I said earlier, prior to the ratification of the Istanbul Convention, the primary human rights body which monitored the responses of and the states in question to the issue of violence against women was the CEDAW committee. And so in assessing the initial steps as regards the reporting procedure under the Istanbul Convention, it is therefore appropriate to draw comparisons with the reporting procedure under CEDAW. And one of the most apparent contrasts between the two procedures relates to the level of detail involved as regards state reporting on violence against women. The reports of all the states uh, so far 
provide extremely in-depth discussion of their responses to this issue. Such detail is of course required by the baseline questionnaire which has been developed by Grevio as the foundation for the initial round of reporting. However, the comparison between this level of analysis and the amount of information which is provided by states on violence against women in their reports to the CEDAW committee is striking. It is therefore certainly the case that reporting to CEDAW requires the state to, um, or to reporting to Grevio rather, requires the state to undertake a much more considered self-assessment of its response to violence against women than does reporting to the CEDAW committee. So the level of self-assessment required for states to compile a report for submission to Grevio may in itself be beneficial in terms of contributing towards the effectiveness of state responses to this issue. Crucially, the reports formulated by Grevio also provide a far more in-depth assessment of the responses of states to the issue of violence against women than do the concluding observations on states' reports which are issued by the CEDAW committee. This point is brought into sharp focus when a comparison is made between the reports of Grevio as regards uh, the states which have undergone the monitoring procedure and the most recent sets of concluding observations issued to these states by the CEDAW committee. Indeed, the full concluding observations documents, which address numerous issues, are much shorter than the reports by Grevio, which address only violence against women and domestic violence. It is also important to note that to date, the procedure used by Grevio in compiling its reports has involved not only a dialogue with state representatives, such as is the case with the UN human rights treaty bodies, but also an evaluation visit to each of the state's parties in question. The carrying out of such visits by Grevio is not mandatory under the Convention. Article 68.9 simply provides for the organisation by Grevio of country visits if the information otherwise obtained is insufficient. However, it is notable that such visits have taken place as regards all of the state's parties which have undergone the first round of reporting. And so it is likely that this trend will continue at least for the remainder of the first reporting cycle. Again, this would seem to be a positive element in that visiting the state in question affords Grevio the opportunity to gain a fuller picture than that which could be obtained through other means. Another interesting aspect of the reporting procedure under the Istanbul Convention is the fact that the state party in question submits comments on the report by Grevio, and these comments are published at the same time as Grevio's report. This is not the normal practice as regards state reactions to reports by other treaty monitoring bodies, such as those of the UN Human Rights Treaties. And from an analysis of the 17 states in question, it seems that states parties will adopt fairly diverse approaches to the style and format of such comments. For example, some states take each of the proposals and suggestions of Grevio in return and provide comments on each. Um, other states provide comments on only a selection of Grevio's recommendations and indeed some states may focus on responding on aspects of Grevio's analysis 
which was the, which the state actually disagrees with. Um, some states respond, as I've said, in large amount of detail. Uh, the comments of other states are much briefer. Nevertheless, despite the variety in the approaches taken by states' parties to providing comments on revenues reports, it seems nevertheless that the provision of such is a useful exercise in that it gives an immediate indication of the responses of states' parties to the proposals and suggestions made by Grevio. Another difference uh, between the reporting procedures under the UN Human Rights Treaty monitoring bodies and under the Istanbul Convention is the involvement of the committee of the parties with the latter. With the reporting mechanisms under the UN Treaty monitoring bodies, the concluding observations of these bodies are essentially the final documents issued to the states in question. However, under the Istanbul Convention, the proposals and suggestions made by Grevio are then considered by the Committee of the Parties, which in turn makes recommendations to the state concerned. And in this respect, an analogy can be drawn with the role of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe in relation to the Advisory Committee on the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities, in that the former makes recommendations based on the latter's report. The fact that the Committee of the Parties is comprised by representatives of the state's parties to the Istanbul Convention may serve to place additional pressure on states to comply with these recommendations, more so than if they were simply made by Grevio without further authorization by any additional body, such as is the case with the recommendations of the UN treaty monitoring bodies. Potentially, therefore, this element may assist to some extent in reducing the implementation difficulties which constitute such a problem for the UN human rights treaties. It is certainly the case that the reporting procedure under the Istanbul Convention is much more detailed than that which operates under the UN treaty monitoring bodies. However, whilst this clearly has advantages, there are also problems entailed with such an approach. In particular, the process is undeniably very time consuming from the perspectives of both Grevio and the states parties in question. The timetable adopted by Grevio for completing the initial round of reporting as regards all of the states parties to the convention is therefore unavoidably of a somewhat protracted nature. During 2016 and 2017, only two states parties received the baseline questionnaire at any one time. However, since February 2018, generally three parties are being sent the questionnaire at a time. This speeds matters up to some extent However, it remains the case that states will generally have been parties to the convention for around four years before they are required to submit their first reports to Grevio. By comparison, all states parties to CEDAW, for example, are required to submit an initial report within two years of ratifying this instrument. It is true that the gradual approach adopted by Grevio is likely to be successful in avoiding the difficulties involving backlogs of reports, which have proven to be so problematic for the UN human rights treaty monitoring bodies. 
Grevio's timetable has obviously been thought out in a very considered manner, with these difficulties clearly at the forefront of the minds of its members. It is thus extremely unlikely that Grevio will fail to meet this timetable. And it is also notable that all of the state's parties which have to date submitted reports to Grevio have done so on time, despite the very detailed nature of the reports which are required. However, despite the possible advantages of the adoption of such a gradual approach to reporting in terms of the avoidance of delays and also as regards the level of detail of the assessments involved, it is nevertheless the case that the use of such an approach would not be possible uh, for UN human uh, rights treaty bodies such as the, C uh, the CEDAW committee for purely practical reasons. Um, there are, for example, 189 states which are party to CEDAW, far, far more than the number, of course, which are party to the Istanbul Convention. So if the CEDAW committee were to adopt a similarly gradual approach to reporting, it simply would not be possible to get through all of the states' parties in question in any type of reasonable time frame. Also, the number of states' parties to treaties such as CEDAW makes the type of in-depth assessment currently being performed by Grevio impossible. Essentially, the UN human rights treaty bodies do not have the time or resources to visit each state party upon receipt of the report from that state, or indeed to make such detailed recommendations to each state as are being made by Grevio. It must nevertheless be remembered that the initial round of reporting to Grevio is different in nature to subsequent grounds. It is only in the initial round that states' parties are required to report on all aspects of their compliance with the Istanbul Convention. For subsequent rounds, a particular aspect of the Convention will be chosen and states' parties will be required to report only on that aspect. It is possible, therefore, that after the initial round, the reporting procedure will speed up, given that it is likely that Grevy will be able to deal with greater numbers of reports being submitted simultaneously than is currently the case. It is notable, however, that although states will not have to include information in their second reports regarding all of the aspects highlighted by Grevio during the first round of reporting as needing attention, they are requested to report to the committee of the parties on the measures adopted to improve the implementation of the convention in respect of the recommendations of this body. A debate which has arisen at the UN level in recent times relates to whether there is a need for a global treaty of violence against women. And in 2016, the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women issued a call for submissions on this matter. Um, the possible disadvantages and advantages of such an instrument more generally lie beyond the scope of this presentation. However, it is likely that any such instrument would bear a strong resemblance to the Istanbul Convention and also that the enforcement mechanisms of such a treaty would be similar to those of other UN human rights treaties and of the Istanbul Convention and would therefore rely primarily on a reporting procedure. The initial experiences of the reporting procedure under the Istanbul Convention are therefore instructive in terms of how reporting under a UN treaty on violence against women might operate. 
Firstly, it is true that a UN treaty on violence against women with its own monitoring body would allow for significantly more in-depth analysis of the responses of states to the issue of violence against women. Currently, this is only one of a multitude of issues which are included in the reports of states to the CEDAW committee and the subsequent concluding observations of the latter. As already noted, given that the concluding observations documents produced by the CEDAW committee are substantially shorter than Grevio's reports, the consideration by Grevio of states' responses to violence against women is far more detailed than the assessment by the CEDAW committee of the responses of states to this issue. The adoption of a UN treaty on violence against women with its own monitoring body would certainly allow for substantially more in-depth analysis of states' responses to violence against women than is currently the case under CEDAW, due simply to the fact that such a monitoring body would be focusing on this sole issue. If a new legally binding instrument at the UN level on violence against women is deemed to be necessary, the question arises of whether this should take the form of a separate treaty or an additional protocol to CEDAW, the monitoring of which would therefore fall within the remit of the CEDAW committee. Um, as regards effectiveness of monitoring, it's submitted that the former approach would certainly seem to be more beneficial. The CEDAW committee is already overstretched and introducing an additional element to the workload of this committee would be very likely to make matters worse in this regard. If such an approach were to be adopted, it is possible that the CEDAW committee may not be able to provide any more detailed analysis of the responses of states to the issue of violence against women than is currently the case. Certainly the adoption of a separate treaty with a new monitoring body would require substantially more resources than would the adoption of an additional protocol to CEDAW, the monitoring of which would come within the remit of the CEDAW committee. However, from a monitoring perspective, it would seem that the benefits of the former would outweigh the advantages entailed by the resources implication. It is also true, however, that even if a UN treaty on violence against women with its own monitoring body were to be adopted, it's unlikely that such a body could engage in assessments as detailed as those which are being carried out by Grevio, simply due to the number of states' parties which such an instrument may have. Um, as I've already mentioned, it is possible that Grevio will be able to deal with greater numbers of states' reports after the initial round of monitoring is complete. Um, so they, that may not pose as great a problem um, as what may currently be the case. Nevertheless, as regards a UN treaty on violence against women, which would be open for ratification by all states globally, it is unlikely that the monitoring body of such an instrument would be afforded the time and resources necessary to produce reports as detailed as those of Grevio, much less to undertake an evaluation visit to each reporting state, such as is Grevio's current practice. So in conclusion, therefore, the reporting procedure under the Istanbul Convention is still in its early stages. As I've said, it will be quite some time before the initial round of reporting for all states which are currently party to the Convention is complete. However, it is clear that states' parties are submitting detailed reports to Grevio, which in turn is carrying out in-depth analyses of the compliance of these states with their obligations under the Convention. 
Overall, initial indications as regards the reporting procedure under the Convention are positive. And it is to be hoped that this trend will continue and that the monitoring system will contribute to establishing the Istanbul Convention as an effective force in the movement to combat violence against women and domestic violence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rano, for the uh, very clear and detailed uh, presentation about the monitoring system. Uh, so now uh, we are in the question and answer part uh, lecture, and uh, everybody can write questions to the chat box. And again, I'm going to read a lot to, for the recording purposes when uh, they write. So uh, let's wait a little bit for the typing of the questions. We have a message from uh, Professor Adam Sözüer, the uh, manager and the uh, president of the uh, summer school. Uh, mm -hmm. He says that, uh, my dear colleague Ronald McQuick, thank you very much for your contribution to our law on the Bosphorus summer school with Northern Ireland report and your work titled Monitoring the Implementation of the Istanbul Convention. As you stated, monitoring mechanisms are quite important for the implementation of the Istanbul Convention. Parties should be more willing to cooperate with the monitoring authorities and share detailed data to come up with the effective solutions. Apart from that, this is our first meeting with you, but hopefully our work will continue for the future. We follow and admire your works on international and regional human rights law, particularly applications with a focus on gender-based violence. We will continue to increase cooperation and joint studies in order to benefit from our experience mutually. I would like to thank you for your contributions again. I hope we will see you in another event soon face to face. All the best, Adam Sözüer. Thank you very much. Uh, it is better. Uh, the, uh, our uh, students have the time to think uh, about the question. Uh, first, my uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, early. Uh, if uh, somebody have a question, uh, it is a very good time now for our uh, question. How are um, you? Yeah, and can I just say, Adam, thank you very much indeed for your very kind comments. Um, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to uh, participate in the summer school. I'm very pleased uh, to be involved and you know, in the future, it would be great to, to participate in another of your events um, in the future. So uh, thank you very much indeed um, for inviting me uh, to be involved with this. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your support. Uh, Istanbul Convention was um, signed uh, 1st August in Turkey, Turkey uh, 1st August. Yesterday uh, was 1st August. Uh, we were a little bit uh, sad because uh, our politician uh, now uh, uh, don't want the Istanbul Convention, but the uh, Istanbul Convention is uh, in our uh, um, brain. Uh, Istanbul Convention is... Uh, a big, uh, the biggest uh, uh, convention uh, for the uh, for the uh, uh, women's, uh, not uh, only the women's in another countries, but especially for uh, Turkish uh, uh, women's uh, women. This is uh, very uh, important uh, uh, for us, and uh, your uh, support is. Uh, very uh, important. We uh, want to fight uh, together for uh, Istanbul uh, Convention. We uh, uh, get never uh, from Istanbul Convention. We uh, want to fight every day, uh, every week, every year. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a uh, one question. Uh, she said, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, how would you review the first decade of the Istanbul Convention? 
Um, yes, well, uh, thank you, uh, you know, for your question indeed. And um, it's, yes, we've just, uh, 2021, it's basically a year, uh, a decade now since uh, 2011. So it's uh, sort of 10 years on. It is a good time to be um, reviewing the Istanbul Convention. Um, uh, overall, I think uh, the Convention has been successful during its first 10 years. Um, I mean, within the uh, Council of Europe, um, the majority of states have either ratified the Convention or signed uh, the Convention, thus indicating their um, intention to be ratified at a later date. Um, here in the UK, uh, we have uh, signed the Convention, uh, but not yet ratified it, um, but ratification should come. Um, overall, I think, as I said, I think the first decade has been a success, uh, largely, um, in terms of monitoring, um, and the monitoring procedures are still at a fairly early stage uh, in comparison with other uh, treaties. Uh, but nevertheless, um, as I said earlier, um, states are producing detailed reports on their compliance. Uh, Grevio is in turn producing uh, detailed reports in terms of the recommendations which should be adopted by states. And it seems from the reports which have been submitted um, to the Committee of the Parties uh, to date, and of course there are only four of those reports as yet, but it seems that states are taking substantial steps to implement the recommendations which are being made to them. So um, by and large, I think the indications are positive. Um, so uh, the challenge now is, to, is for the Assembly Convention to and um, hopefully proceed to um, contribute further to the movement uh, to combat um, violence against women and domestic violence. And thank you for the answer. There is an, another question from Anika Yugo. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. And I just have a follow-up question. Can it be said that these conventions and their committees are more about helping with regional laws? Because if I understood it correctly, they give suggestions to regional representatives, but don't actually have any ability to force changes. And um, that's a really good question, um, Annika. So very, uh, very many thanks for that. Uh, and this comes back to your point um, about the problems to do with the implementation of um, human rights. Uh, treaties generally. So, for example, in the UN uh, context, um, the CEDAW committee um, makes recommendations um, in the form of concluding observations as to what states should do. But there's no sort of international police force, if you like, which can then force states to comply uh, with these recommendations. So, there in a sense, they are what can be termed soft law, okay? So um, in that it is very difficult to, to compel states uh, to comply with recommendations um, if they're not willing to do so. And it's really about, you know, political forces and what political forces can be brought to bear on states to comply. And um, certainly, um, the recommendations which have been which have been made by say the UN human rights bodies can be used by more localized bodies uh, within states themselves, so non-governmental organizations, for example, uh, to try to place pressure on governments to comply with the recommendations that have been made to them internationally. And that's certainly a strategy. Uh, that can be used um, by uh, national human rights organizations um, to try and make international human rights law more effective in their specific areas. Um, but I mean, you are correct in saying that um, UN bodies don't actually have the ability to force changes as such. Um, there's quite a bit of literature on that, so if you're sort of interested in 
reading more about that, you know, there's quite a bit of literature that you could consult. Uh, but definitely it's a big issue in international human rights law. So um, thank you for, for asking your question on that. Thank you very much for the response. Uh, there is another question from Savia Hagyoksu Tezer. Uh, how does the definition differences of terms between states affect the implementation and should we bring a criteria for defining keywords? Okay, that's an interesting question, Savia. Thank you for that. Um, and yes, you are right. I mean, states can define things in different ways. So even, you know, let's take the term uh, domestic balance, for example. Um, you know, some may view domestic balance as, you know, um, balance between people in a intimate relationship. And uh, some may see domestic balance as family balance. So, balance between any members of the family and so on and and also in relation to approaches to dealing with something like domestic balance and um, some states may take a gender neutral approach such as to, as is taken here in northern ireland um, or um, a gendered approach may be taken and um, by some states uh, or by some states see that uh, domestic violence is an example of gender-based violence and perhaps um, more focus should be placed on dealing with that domestic violence against women, for example. And those uh, differences in definitions can lead to difficulties. Um, the Istanbul Convention um, is quite good in terms of definitions, in terms of, you know, setting out what exactly it means uh, by um, domestic violence and so on. So from a definitional perspective, um, the Istanbul Convention, I think, is quite good in terms of setting out, well, how should states uh, define certain things? Um, but perhaps at the UN level, um, it could be more of a problem. For example, let's take um, the CEDO Convention. There's actually no express mention of violence against women at all in the CEDO Convention. And basically, the CEDO Committee has interpreted uh, the CEDO Convention in such a way as to um, encompass violence against women and doing domestic violence. So, you know, there's certainly a lack of definitional clarity in relation specifically to the CEDO Convention itself as regards such terms because they're simply not mentioned in the CEDO Convention, although uh, the CEDO Committee has gone on uh, to provide um, some clarity as regards how terms like domestic violence should be defined. Um, but nevertheless, um, the interpretations of the CEDAW committee could be said to be sort of soft law interpretations uh, because um, these statements that they've made are not actually found in the CEDAW convention itself, which is the, uh, the treaty that is legally um, binding on states. So uh, again, thanks to the um, very good question there. Um, about the differences in definitions and the problems that they can cause. A good issue to raise. Thank you so much again for the response. Uh, I think there is uh, no more another question. Uh, so if it's okay, we can uh, just finish right now. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, contributions to the uh, our summer school it was a very uh, the two of the uh, presentations were very uh, enlightened us so i hope we will see you again on the another uh, another congress or something like that and also we would like to see you face to face so thank you very much uh, today is finished right now so uh, for all the participants, see you on the next uh, tomorrow uh, at 3 uh, p.m. At, as for Turkish time. So uh, thank you very much. I wish you all to have a nice day and goodbye.
And so thank you very much, everybody, and all the very best for the rest of the summer school. Thank you.